Greetings, everyone. I'm delighted to welcome you to this edition of discussing the Global Business Complexity Index from TMF Group with a specific focus in India with a webinar titled India's Growth Journey in Certainly a More Complex World. This is the fourth year we're honored at having this partnership with the Indian government and sharing the insights as to what drives business decision making and complexity across in, uh, global businesses. We're also very honored to have all the esteemed audience across the world, different organizations with a specific interest to learn more about this. Who better to bring out this edition than Deepak, who heads Invest India and has been handpicked by the Prime Minister himself uh, for this journey around growth? I remember in 2017, when we started this journey, India was the 10th most complex country in all the jurisdictions. We've progressed to being 25th now, which is a good journey to have covered. But also, Deepak, for me, Invest India is specifically inspirational, being the most awarded investment agency across the world. And also, I was heartened to see the Great Place to Work certification, which just brings it all together. Deepak's had a professional career for over three decades with the World Bank, Citibank, private equity, having had responsibilities across the world, Europe, Africa, Asia. He's currently the managing director and CEO of Invest India, the national investment promotion and facilitation agency promoted by the government of India. Invest India is also the execution agency for Startup India and Prime Minister's Science and Technology Initiative. Deepak's also the president of Geneva-based World Association of Investment Promotion Agencies with membership of over 100 countries. An absolute honor and privilege to welcome you to the webinar, Deepak. Thank you, Shankar. Then I'd like to welcome Raman Sidhu. Uh, Raman's been with us on this journey since the very start. Uh, Raman's the chairman of European Business Group Federation in India. He's also a senior advisor and an independent director in multiple boards across private, public sector enterprises, and also Indian corporates to give him that fully rounded perspective. Raman's one of the four life trustees of Foundation for Aviation and Sustainable Tourism, and also a co-founder and past president of the Public Affairs Forum of India. Welcome to the webinar, Raman, and thanks for the support all this along. We've also got Mark Wild joining in, who's our CEO of the TMF Group. Uh, Mark's been a strong supporter and really took the experiences of sharing this and the working along with the government here in India, then across to do the same models with Brazil, Mexico, Amst uh, Netherlands, and many other countries. Mark's worked as a consultant for over two decades, again across Europe, North America, and Asia. He became a partner at Oliver Wyman, where he ran the global retail banking practice and also later the EMEA region. Following this, Mark was appointed Marsh's CEO, UK and Ireland. Uh, during his tenure, it became the largest insurance <laughs> broker in UK. Mark's led work on cyber risk for the UK government and joined TMF as a CEO in 2018. Delighted to have you here at the webinar again, Mark. Thank you. With that, Mark, I'll hand it over to you actually to kick it off and share the Global Business Complexity Index format with the audience. Thank you, Shagun, and again, thank you, the panelists. Maybe before we begin, I should just acknowledge we're going to be touring the world and looking at economic factors. As I speak, the headlines for coming out of Turkey and Syria, 17,000 dead are pretty shocking. Uh, and I just want to acknowledge uh, that fact that we, we continue, the world turns, but it's a rather a dramatic backdrop to a, an event looking at uh, world affairs and uh, and business complexity. So with that, let me just say we, we have done this study now for uh, many years, uh, heading towards our 10th anniversary. In fact, we look at key jurisdictions the uh, you know, in terms of their co coverage of the world economy and uh, foreign direct investment. It's the large majority of both. So around 92 percent of GDP covered in this study. And what we're trying to do is identify the burden on businesses of operating in country when you look at the rules around, for example, accounting and tax, uh, setting up and managing legal entities uh, and then employing people. Uh, it's, not, it's not all the costs that you face. It's not to do with the commercial opportunity you face. It's a measure of the burden. And while we don't put numbers to it, other studies tend to think of these things as amounting to several thousand dollars, uh, euros per employee. So it can be really material 
Uh, and that cost, of course, is carried ultimately by the economy. It, it is bad for business, it's bad for an inward investment, and it's bad for local kind of capital formation and entrepreneurship. So uh, all in all, that's why we study it. And we do it in some detail. We look at over 250 factors per jurisdiction to get into enough granularity to be able to guide our clients as to what to expect. And for those governments that wish to act upon it, and India has certainly been one of those, where they might look to make changes to improve their competitiveness in this regard with respect to uh, ease of doing business. So with that, we uh, move on to the next slide. Uh, I'll just note the, the headlines. This is the 2022 report. We're a little bit behind ourselves. We're a few months away from seeing changes to 2023, but some things are consistent. And Latin America has consistently been one of the most complex, right, the most complex region to do business. And some of that relates to structural factors. So Brazil tops the ranking. You'll see when we look at the aggregate ranking that very large geographies, economies, populations in India, China, Brazil, certainly uh, uh, three such, are almost inherently complex because you have different levels of legislature from uh, local to regional to state level. And that tends to be inherently structurally complex. Brazil, however, takes it a little bit further and uh, is always high in complexity and now tops the rankings again in 2022. And then at the simpler end, you have somewhere like Cayman. Now, geographically, you might say, well, it's a tiny offshore location, uh, and so it would be simpler. Well, th that may well be true, and I think there is something in that. But there's also something mm -hmm. we learned when we look at some of the other simple places to do business, that some of this is a choice uh, that sits with governments and regulators, indeed populations, as to what they value uh, and uh, the trade-offs they make. So we move on to look uh, a little bit more detail. Uh, this gives you uh, the 10 most complex places to do business, and it makes the point that not all of these are major sort of uh, subcontinents like uh, Brazil might be. So France, for example, uh, has always been somewhat complex. It's got uh, more so in 2021. And, you know, as an example, I've quoted before in these <coughs> studies, France has a 3,000 page employment law, the Code du Travail, 300 pages of which dedicated to what you have to follow to exit an employee. That may be uh, a choice the people make because they value that protection, of course, is discouraging to employment if you're looking to invest in France. So there are trade-offs in all these things, but you have here a number of countries that uh, make themselves complex to operate, and that creates that high burden I referred to and is discouraging to investors. It doesn't stop them investing, and in fact, many of the more complex jurisdictions are also rather high as attractors of foreign direct investment to do with their local economy, resources, population, etc. But they would clearly, we think, do better were they to simplify. We move on. Uh, this gives you the 10 simplest jurisdictions. I want to make the point that, yes, the Cayman Islands comes top there and, and you have Curaçao, for example, Hong Kong. So there are a number of the traditional offshore hubs here, but there are two things to note. One is they have to compete in a very raw sense with each other for very mobile global investment dollars that uh, funds may set up there and then use it as a base for investment. So in that sense, they represent what happens if competitive pressure forces a simplification. Now, it also might lead to forms of simplification that major economies don't like, like tax competition, for example, or uh, under stressing the uh, KYC and other rules for doing business there. That's much less the case these days because of global pressure. But what it does also say is they've had to make it very easy to establish and operate because if not, uh, those investors have many choices. Uh, they're there uh, as the ease of business doing it is the is the dominant factor. And the second thing I want to stress is not all the places there tick that box. And, and two obvious ones to call out are Denmark and the United States. Denmark, far from being an offshore hub, uh, has a very heavy state uh, role and tax burden. But they've clearly focused on simplicity, transparency, making it easy to do business. And the United States is one of those places that you could argue is also uh, structurally complex. Uh, you know, it's a federation of states with their own legislation as well as state level. And yet they've managed to make it easy to do business. 
Uh, and in our view, in the long run, that's got to be helpful to their attraction of uh, foreign direct investment. It's not the only factor, but it's it's got to be good for your economic growth over time. So we move on to uh, then look at the uh, rankings as a whole. This shows you uh, how how countries sit in our ranking. And just to note, uh, Shagun has uh, has already given my headline away, which is if you take India's rank, it's improved significantly over the years. It's uh, in last year was uh, 25. The higher the number, the better, because you're uh, less complex. Uh, and so a significant step up on prior year. I won't get into the detail as to the particular factors. It's complex because we look at, I say, 250 things. And there have also been some movements in both directions. I will say with the, the, the impact of COVID was polarizing because some countries responded better than others. For some, it was a catalyst to do things like move to electronic uh, interactions with the authorities, making it much simpler, for example, to avoid physical notaries, things like that. Others much less so, and it just slowed down a lot of processes to get anything done. So we move on again to uh, just talk a little bit about uh, some of the factors we've seen. We pulled out three factors in the report last year. One was the impact of emerging uh, from COVID-19, which I just really described. Most government support schemes came to an end in 2022. And as I say, some jurisdictions definitely catalyzed their change to be more streamlined, more efficient, more electronic in a lot of the processes that have been helpful to uh, company burden. Uh, in terms of simplification, drivers and barriers, I mean, there's a, there's a lot going on. Well, I think Shagan said in his introduction about uh, the world, it definitely feels more complex in general. And we obviously we have uh, a very uncertain geopolitical outlook with, you know, uh, let's call them big power tensions going on both regionally, globally, uh, as well as, you know, some initiatives, for example, the OECD G7 initiative around um, uh, tax rates and the like. So it's a complicated picture. Uh, and then finally, one thing we pick up on is ESG. The EU now has a uh, reporting standard CSRD on this, which will uh, affect 50,000 companies, including many Indian ones, by the way, invested in the EU uh, and their reporting requirements over the next years. And we've definitely seen an increase in director liability in this regard and reporting requirements and investor expectations. So. Uh, you may well be a strong advocate for ESG. You may not be, but if you are, all will do is observe that 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 rise does create more burden on companies and on director responsibilities to meet those expectations. So if we move on to uh, just talk about why it matters. I just want to be clear. This this is a sort of a high level picture of if you look at wealth indicators here, for example, we're predominantly looking at um, GDP per capita, so a measure of prosperity uh, against complexity, there is something of a pattern uh, that broadly, the more complex you are, the more likely you are to have a less prosperous population and vice versa. So causation is debatable, but in our view, over time, complexity is not your friend because it's just a burden on starting a business, running a business and investing in the jurisdiction. And so this is why we uh, study it and why we encourage simplification, appropriate simplification of the rules to reduce that burden. If we move on to uh, the next slide. This is another way it matters and it matters to our clients. I just want to, in a way, it's why TMF exists. So it's a chart that counts heavily for me. But the blue bars are actually, it's the revenue per location of our top 20 clients who are major multinational financial institutions and corporates. And it just shows you the typical pattern, which is you have a few places, your head office, regional hubs, where you have most of your people, and then you have a long tail of all the other locations. And you know, our typical clients might be in 20, 40, 60, maybe even 100 uh, countries. And we put below that in red, amber and green, the complexity index for those locations. And what our client base is typically doing is their big populations are in relatively simple jurisdictions. And they then have a long tail in relatively complex jurisdictions. And that long tail is where potentially places like India might sit for, say, a, a US European firm. And it's obviously discouraging to that becoming uh, one of those hubs. So it matters. And their challenge, of course, is how you manage that complex tail when you don't have the scale or the people to cope. It becomes particularly 
uh, burdensome to them, which is another reason it's almost like an amplifier of complexity for your typical multinational uh, organization. If we move on to the next chart. Uh, this uh, makes the point that there are some things going on, and one of the factors that's really affected in 2022 going on into 2023, I'm sure we'll get questions on this as well, is employment. So we have uh, from our uh, payroll work, uh, many hundreds of thousands of employees data that we manage. And it makes a point that in the period of 2020, 21 and going into 2022, we saw our clients saw a significant rise in staff turnover. This is voluntary attrition and it shows you it rising for, you know, there's something like um, 90 jurisdictions represented here and, and some hundreds of thousands of employee records. Uh, our client attrition rising from about 15 to about 25 percent. So that's a very significant increase in staff turnover that you've had to cope with. And one observation we make is to be wary on the right hand side. Uh, attrition in a given jurisdiction against the complexity of it. So the first point to make is that average rise, the so-called great resignation varies a lot by country. In some countries like Argentina is actually rather low. There's like four, five, six percent attrition. In others, uh, UK, Poland, India, for example, much higher staff turnover, at least in our clients experience. And you need to be wary of uh, staff attrition in general because it's bad for your costs, for your customer service. But in jurisdictions that are complex, it may also herald future regulatory problems because you start to lose some control. And I'll just note here as a specific point for India, what we've seen is a combination of being relatively complex and high um, staff turnover for our clients. And for many of them, India has been one of their key talent hubs where they've placed bets. That includes TMF itself, by the way, because of the amazing uh, talent pool India presents. And that comes particularly onerous and could indeed be a watch point just as China and the diversification of supply chains is now. Uh, we're seeing it amongst our clients after the COVID lockdowns. For India, one of the challenges is to make to, to try and get on top of a very heated labour market. Uh, given uh, the impact that may have on investors in the country. OK, if we move on. I just want to finish by noting uh, we, we collect a lot of data. We produce it in a simple ranking. The ranking is eye catching, but in a way isn't the point. It's the detail that matters. Uh, we view complexity as not a reason not to invest, but a reason, a, a way to invest with your eyes open. So we now hold the data we collect on our website uh, in public access to it. So our clients can dig in and look at particular factors for particular countries that create that complexity so that as they're planning their investments, they go in aware of, for example, employment law complexity and that they're prepared for it and appropriately resourced. So we've done that. We'll continue to work on this and make it a sort of public good uh, for our clients and of course for uh, bodies like Invest India who are driving their uh, their sort of program of transformation to give them guidance on how they may benchmark. So with that, I think I'm uh, done. I'm going to hand it back uh, to uh, to you, Shagun. Thank you very much, Mark, for sharing those insights. Uh, and it's been especially encouraging as we've received feedback from many of our clients who are looking at entering India and other jurisdictions that they've used the study and the dashboard to really walk in with wide, eyes wide open. It's still the economic opportunity, it's the talent pool, but it's also knowing what it is. Deepak, as we were talking, this is the first year of the study when there is no Asian country in the top 10 more complex. I mean, India's had a phenomenal journey in terms of that growth. Handing it over to you for your thoughts and insights. Thank you, Shagun, and good to have you and Mohan with us here. And Raman, thank you for getting us all together. Mark, I told you our tea is becoming cold, but you're still missing it. You're getting the second round here. But I must comment, I think uh, it's a very interesting study. I haven't gone much into detail on it, but I was seeing the parameters on which you've created it. And uh, a few points on it on a very cursory basis, and we are going to go through it much more in detail going forward. One is, and uh, you mentioned about the WIPA platform. So we have this platform called the World Association of Investment Promotion Agencies. We've got 105 of them currently with us, and we're working very closely even on the G20 initiative on that. 
it's a very interesting point you bring up because in our last global meet, which we had in September in Geneva, this was one of the points of discussion and there was a clear positive correlation between complexity and adoption of digitalization. And I'm seeing that happen in India and I will speak a little about it, but definitely countries and businesses which are faster in adoption and adapting both to digitization are seeing complexity moving away. The second very interesting discussion which happened on a round table was complexity versus credibility. And this is another point we discussed briefly before we joined all of you that when you are in a position of transition, there is a lot of overhang of the past which tends to color perception. And in that coloring of perception, you might have to take some extra steps on complexity to bring in that credibility and then later weigh it off. But yes, that's an interesting balance which one has to maintain to take that forward. Uh, glad to see that India's ranks have improved, so I obviously will vote for your study, but more importantly, <laughs> we will go through in detail. But just to put it in perspective for you, yes, the complexity was huge here. And you know, what you're seeing is a movement of about 10 to 15 positions, but even in the World Bank ease of doing ranking, uh, we moved from 144 to 62. And that even as per the World Bank said, it's unprecedented for any large economy on the planet thus far. But let me tell you, even to do that movement, the government in the past 84 to 90 months has done away and redone 39,000 policy interventions. 39,000. And in addition to that, we've decriminalized another about 3,000 plus laws uh, just to reorient those laws and makes them more business friendly. So you can see how fast India is transforming in that direction. And if I may just continue in that vein, one of the biggest things which is happening in India, which is leading to this transformation, the ease of doing business initiative, is digitization. We are digitizing each and every aspect of the investor journey. What that is doing is, one, it is bringing out a huge level of transparency. The second part to that is we're getting a chance to see where the delays are and trying to re-engineer the approval process. So what I do want to share with you, we've done a soft launch of the National Single Window, NSWS. You can come onto my website, get onto it, it's an AI driven website. It will ask you a few questions. You will have one form which will come out, which you will complete, and that form will get you all approvals, both for the central government and my respective state governments. Just to put it in perspective, I have 28 state governments and eight special territories. So you can see that the diversity is quite there. We've already done close to about 30,000 approvals on this one in the soft launch. And uh, we're hoping to see how it comes up very fast. We've got some excellent reviews because one of the feedback which we were getting from the global investor community was about the ease of doing business or the complexity of it, and especially in the initial approval processes. And I think this is what is now bringing that transparency and the speed and the accountability. So this is a big initiative. This, to my mind, is changing the investor experience in India in a big manner. And we are working on it on a daily basis to get the feedback and then incorporate that into it. You had mentioned ESG, uh, Mark, and I must tell you that is one of the central pillars of India's economic development. And I'm going to come to those points a little about what we are going through. You're going to give me 10 minutes to yep. speak? How yeah. much time 10, do you have? 12 minutes. 10 to 12 minutes. So I'll do two, uh, two more minutes on ESG. Sure. And uh, that is a central pillar for us. In fact, we were the only ones in the uh, earlier COP which has been able to keep its under 2% deadline. Uh, we have by 2070 a zero carbon promise, and we've got the fastest growth in the transition of green energy. In fact, what we are wanting to do is to be the first green industrial revolution of the world, and we are all set on that path. And this is a path which has been charted to us by the Prime Minister, Mr. Modi himself, and permeates right down because I've always said ESG is both policy as well as a mindset. And where India is concerned, we have both the policy which is driven and articulated and implemented by the senior most uh, level of the government and bottom up approach, 
everything in India is reused, reduced, and recycled. So that is a common mindset of each and every one of us, so it's both top down and bottom up. With that, let me just spend and share with you what is happening in India. And just step back, guys. I know you all have your thoughts of what you imagine India is about, the complexity, the bureaucracy. At times you might have thought and heard about the corruption, the delays. Just step back for a minute and let me just share with you some facts and numbers and then take a call on what you think of it. The first, and I'll talk about my story is uh, beginning from 2014-15 when Prime Minister Modi came into power. So I'm not taking you back too much into history. I'm giving you facts as they sit with us currently. Let me start off by saying that this is the most unprecedented transformation in the free world. And I know it's a very strong statement, so let me just take it further with you. Both in terms of the scale and the pace at which this transformation is happening. And the interesting element why this transformation is happening in such an unprecedented manner, because for the first time in our history, and it's a history which happens with every nation at some point in their development, the transformation and all the three pillars of our existence, which is social, economic and political, are happening at a great pace at the same time. And they're feeding into each other to create that sense of singularity. Now let me share with you some numbers and take you there. The first is on the economic side of it, because I was told we all have all of you as senior business representatives taking care of your business. In the past 90 months, as a size of my GDP, I moved ahead of Russia, Italy, Brazil, France and UK from number 10 to number five. We're looking to be number four in the next 12 to 18 months. We're looking at number three in the next 36 months. I have a GDP today of 3.5 trillion. And even at that stage, it is the fastest growing large economy on the planet. Before we went into uh, the pandemic, we were growing at seven to eight percent. We are back at six and a half percent on the most lowest level of, uh, uh, you know, predictions by the pundits. We're looking at about 7% this year and scaling it up much further. The interesting thing of that $3.5 trillion, which I am today, I'm probably the only economy on the planet where two third of that is driven by domestic demand. Keep that in mind. And that domestic demand means that we have a business model where demand is always ahead of supply. So it's the market forces which are creating this momentum to a large extent. And to some extent, it also insulates us in some manner to some of the global trends which are happening, which is my global, which is my internal demand. The other interesting element, and let me take you to the FDI part of it, the total FDI I would have received in my history, and remember, uh, I may be an old democracy, but I'm one of the youngest nations on the planet. I got my freedom on 15th August 1947, so I'm just celebrating my 75 years of freedom. In this 75 years, the total FDI I got was about $950 billion. But let me tell you more interestingly, more than 50% of that, that is $535 billion I've got in the past 84 months. In fact, every year for the past eight years, I've set a new FDI record, record for myself. And even in the midst of the most unprecedented lockdown in human history, which we had in 21 and 22, I closed 22 with the highest ever FDI I've got in my history, which was over $83.5 billion. But let me tell you what was more interesting of that. This 83.5 and this 532, which I explained to you in the past 84, 90 months, has come from 161 countries. It's a global record. And remember, FDI is not just about a dollar or a cent which is coming in. It is about trust in India's future. It is about trust in India's leadership. It is about the trust in the opportunity which they find in India. And most importantly, it is about the trust in India's ability to partner and to be able to deliver on a promise and 
where you safeguard your future with your partner with India. And we are extremely cognizant of that trust which these 161 countries have put into India. In fact, every time you will hear our prime minister speak, it is about living up to that trust. And to each and every partner in that endeavor. 161 countries, a global record. Let me tell you the second leg of that. It's come in 62 sectors. Another global record. The breadth of the opportunity in India is expanding at one of the fastest rates available anywhere else. And that takes me back to my first sentence, which I mentioned to you, the most unprecedented transformation happening, not just in my history, but in the history of the free world. That means that each and every sector of my existence is getting disrupted and is open for private partnership and private participation. In fact, India is one of the most open economies on the planet today. The private sector and the global partner can play a role in each and every sector of my economy, including defense. It's completely open. It has to be, it's a democracy, but more importantly, it is open for investment and partnership in each one of them. And now let me tell you the third leg of that FDI, which to my mind is the most gratifying part of it. And then I'll just take five minutes, Shagun, to explain one or two factors why this is happening. I mentioned to you earlier that I have 28 states and eight special territories. That means 36 of them. For the first time in my history, that FDI has now come into 31 of them. So the growth of India is no longer top down. The growth of this juggernaut is being propelled bottom up. And when I told you that I have those 61, 62 sectors where it is coming and it is fast expanding as the opportunity space, the reason is the diversity of India and these states and special territories. The thing is that each of my states has a special USP sitting with it. Either it be the only organic state in the world, or it be the richest in richest minerals, or it could be skill sets, or it could be proximity to a port and uh, the entire logistics. So for each one of you, when you're looking for that investment, you're finding that place here where it is. And now that it is getting disrupted across so many sectors, you can see that the opportunity space is expanding rapidly. Now, just to share with you, I explained to you the scale of what is happening. I also mentioned to you the pace. And on the scale side, let me leave a few other thoughts with you before I come to the pace. I'm the highest human capital on the planet as of the past two weeks. I've touched 1.4 billion human resource. When I turn 100 years, which is just another 9,000 days away, that means 15th August 2047, I will have 1.6 billion of human resource. 21% of the world's middle class will be in India. 20% of the world's skilled workforce will be from India. Just think of that trend. Add it to a trend where you have a large economy, which is at the fastest growing large economy, which is continuing. And consumerism coming in. And now let me give you to the other part of what is happening. When I told you I'm 1.4 billion, my average age in India today is 29. I'm the youngest on the planet and I shall remain so all the way up to 2070. Think about that demographic. Think about the consumerism. Think about the dependency ratio. Think about that engine which is propelling that growth. And let me take you to the last part before I get on to the pace at which I'm changing. I've shown to you the economics which are changing. I've shown to you the demographics and the social element which is changing. The third element, and you will ask me, since we are a democracy, what is happening on my politics? Well, my last elections, and we have an election every five years, and by the way, I have a three-tier system of democracy where I have elections every five years at a village level, at a city municipality level, 
at the state level and at the central government level. So these are four layers. By the way, I must also mention to you that on gender inclusivity, and we had this huge panel in uh, Davos just three weeks ago on gender inclusion. They were aghast to see the steps taken by this government on gender inclusion. And already, even at my village level, more than one third of the elected representatives are women. It starts at the very bottom level on India. But coming back to my politics, and I was just sharing with you my last election, my next uh, All India general election is going to be happening next year in 2024, sometime in the second quarter. But the last one, I had over 980 million registered voters, of which over 630 million actually cast their franchise. I had over a million booths. Repolling was only in 218 of them only because of inclement weather. We performed the most complex exercise on the planet of the free world to a Sigma 6X. And that was done and see the participation level, by the way, was done because freedom and democracy is completely inherent in the DNA of each and every Indian. And that gets translated to each and every partner with us in our journey. And let me give you another interesting element of that. My first time voters, what I mean by them is those are the ones which have just come of age to be able to vote for the first time were 18 million. Can you see that number as a swing factor? This 80 million of my youngsters have the same aspiration as any of you in London, New York, Singapore. They look for good economics. They want a better job. They want a better quality of life. My politics today is run by good economics. Good economics today is the center of good politics in India. And now you see how all these three elements are coming together in my history. And by the way, we call it a circle of life. I really believe in that Elton John song for Lion King, and it's one of my favorite ones. And why I say the circle of life and where I'm seeing the singularity create this momentum, because if you go back in history and look at the numbers from 1750 to 1850, 24 percent of the world's GDP was from India. It's an economic historian which is out of the UK. Another 24 percent was equally with China. And then by the time in 1947 I got my independence, I was less than 1 percent of the global GDP. That circle is circling back in life. Now to take you to my last five minutes, and I know you're getting impatient, Shagun, because I've taken more time than I should, but this is critical. For you to understand that why is this transformation happening at such an unprecedented pace? And if somebody had to ask me one single factor which takes me to that is digitization. For the first time in my history, digitization has completely democratized not only every human resource ability to participate in my growth, but to partake from the benefits of that growth. You know, I remember when I was in my school, one of the biggest challenges they faced for India's growth, which my, my economics book used to tell me, was India's population. Today, that has been turned as my biggest strength. Because each one is enabled, and let me leave two or three statistics with you on that one. January, July 15th, 2015, that is what, 84 months? 90 months, let's say. The Honorable Prime Minister, Mr. Modi, launched Digital India. My global ranking in per capita data consumption on that day was 123. Take a guess what it was last year. I was number one in the world. India consumed more per capita mobile data than the US and China put together. And please remember, I'm the second largest on the net today. I'm the largest not yet on the net. And every three seconds, Every second, sorry, three new people are joining the net in India. So this story has only just begun. Let me give you the second element of how it is impacting your business. 
for the first time in human economic history, a brand new company got 100 million new customers in 180 days. That big opportunity sitting there and this digitization is making it easier for you to access that opportunity. Last year, 41% of the world's real time transactions happened in India. I did 48 billion real time transactions. I was number one. Number two was China with 18 billion. Let me tell you how fast that is changing. In October last year itself, so I'm talking of 21. In 22 October, in that one month itself, I clocked in 8.4 billion transactions. That means I'm at a run rate of 100 billion. The, what have, that means? I've done two and a half times every year. You're seeing the pace at which India is changing. And my last point, Shadu, and this is from the business perspective. The other big thing of India, and which is now getting globally acknowledged and actually is now a case study in many business schools, January 2016, 16th January 2016, the Prime Minister launched Startup India. Startup India is about my entrepreneurship, is about my innovation. That day we had 453 registered startups with the government. Today I have over 90,000 startups. I'm number three in the world in number of unicorns, number two in the world in number of startups, number one in the world with new startups adding every day. In fact, on my unicorns, in the midst of the most unprecedented lockdown in 2020, I added a unicorn every 26 days. 2021, you remember the lockdown continued and it was worse. I added a unicorn every nine days. <clears throat> in the third quarter of last year, I added more unicorns than any other country on the planet. This is the entrepreneurship. This is the zeal. And this is the beginning of a new future. And for you, it is that partner which wants to work with you, not just for itself, but for all of us together. Thank you. Thank you very much, Deepak. Absolutely riveting. Huh? I was trying to see how many of those facts I can remember, but I've noted them all down. But like you said, this story has just begun. And the other part which we find pivotal is FDI is as much about trust and credibility as pure good economics. With that, I'm going to open it up for questions. We've got some questions flowing in and I'll take the liberty of uh, guiding those through. One of the questions that came up in sync with what Mark and Deepak spoke about, uh, and I'd read the question. Do you think the global downturn has a long term effect on the India growth story? Maybe Deepak, I'll direct it to you first and then Raman pull you in for your views. So one is I think. And this was acknowledged in Davos also, by the way, two weeks ago. That India is a shining example and listen, I'm not trying to uh, showcase on this one. We've just lucky we have a great leadership which shows that even some of the most toughest times of human history, how if you have a good leadership, it can chart you through well. And please don't forget that even now I'm giving free food grain and free food to 800 million individuals. It's the largest ever welfare scheme right during COVID. Apart from the fact that I've done over now two and a half billion vaccinations, all done out of vaccine. But let me tell you, we went into COVID growing at seven, seven and a half percent. We are moving out of COVID growing at over six and a half, seven percent. The other thing is, and we were with, I was with the foreign minister of one of uh, the big countries of G20 just day before yesterday, and they were saying that the change, the geopolitical change today is going to create a completely new set of trends and relationships which will govern us at least for the next two to three decades. We are seeing that, for example, Canada is opening up to the Pacific and they were completely focused on Europe at one point of time. They have an entire chapter on India there. And I think that is where India is emerging as one of the sweet spots for the entire world, so as to speak. And one of the things which came up in Davos was not only India's economic leadership and the opportunity which it provides, but the faith that this leadership can also work to bring solutions 
to some other troubled issues which we are all facing. And they're all looking up in many ways, and it was expressed virtually at every forum there that in, they are looking at India to be able to do that. All this together and the efforts on the ease of doing business, just to put it in perspective for all of you, my own book for FDI, where we have a specific team dedicated to work with an investor, you get a dedicated relationship manager with no charge. The, order, the book, the, my FDI book, that means I'm working close with each one of you. I know exactly what your plan is and how much you're going to be investing. Before we went into the pandemic, I was at about $70 billion. Today, I've crossed $200 billion on that book. Already told you it's across 61 sectors. So please remember the supply chain movement mm -hmm. where the big opportunity which is coming in India. So it's not only near shoring for an opportunity, it's also for a friend shoring because you have a free, open, democratic setup where there's a lot of trust which the world is now coming into. And that diversification is no longer just China plus one. It's actually plus one. So from across the globe, we are seeing that happen. Raman, all to you. Thank you, <laughs> Deepak. Thank you, Shagun. Um, Deepak, when you talk about these fascinating changes that are take, uh, taking place, sweeping India, there is a contradiction in terms of one word that you used. Now, that is a word which actually I used to use many years back, that India is like a juggernaut. It is not a juggernaut. A juggernaut has a habit of move, moving with the sheer momentum of its size, and which India continues to do, but it used to move forward and then stop and then roll back a little and then again move forward. It is no longer a juggernaut. And amongst various other things, including the leadership and the decisions they have taken, India is reshaping itself. In a, in a world where, as Shagun said, it's increasingly getting more complex, it's also dynamic, uh, the risks and op opportunities landscape that brings uh, the spot in front of us and the impact of which is increasingly getting wider and unpredictable as the business environment gets more uh, dynamic uh, also gives us an opportunity which India is actually fully using. But I would like to uh, add one more important reason why India is changing or this juggernaut is changing. You talked about the 28 plus 8 jurisdictions. Let me call them parishes. The reverends who run these parishes have also turned into a listening mode. In a, earlier, there was no, it was just not a done thing to listen to issues that your constituents were facing. Today, there was 36 jurisdictions, if not all, a number of them, and they're being, they're, they're being forced to compete for investments in their jurisdiction right. and they're all you know taking that opportunity as it comes and improving the listening and sorting out issues and that is also why india has been changing despite a very difficult period unprecedented very strong domestic market which you again brought to everyone's attention that will remain and if it's two-third that's a pretty large figure but exports are also picking up but, you know, the spectrum of risks that investors now face when they come in, which includes industry specific risk, strategic ESG was mentioned, increasingly more uh, important operational reporting, compliance, reputational. These risks will uh, grow uh, while we can remain being risk intelligent, but we must also equip ourselves when we're coming into a country. And that's why I find organizations like TMF who have certain values, you know, a culture which is European, uh, which brings uh, more comfort to investors who are looking to invest in a country like India, uh, is very comforting. And uh, I have seen an increasing desire of investors to work with such organizations, not just TMF, there are others like that, but that's a very good example. At the moment, I would stop here. Thank, thank you very much, Raman. Thank you, Deepak. Uh, Mark, I'll uh, probably uh, request you to share your views on the next question. It says, what are the top two, three things a foreign company should be considering while investing in India through an acquisition? I know acquisition overall is a heightened activity that we've seen. So maybe you can share the more global perspective that you're seeing, and then I'll uh, put it to Deepak from an India perspective. Yeah, and as you know, we, we have acquired, and I'm sure will acquire again, 
and I'll just I maybe maybe it's a segue from the previous question. I mean, I pointed out in 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 the experience of our clients' labor data, India is a bit of victim of its own success. So during the pandemic, uh, we certainly increased our employment in India, and I think many of our clients did the same because it it became easier to envisage working with people around the world in a pandemic where people were anyway working remotely and I suspect has been rather good for India in that regard and uh, and it's worked well for us and for many of our clients. In fact, in as uh, Deepak pointed out, the world's uh, largest population with terrific demographics, if the problem you've got is uh, high demand for employees leading to high staff turnover, in a way that's a good thing. <laughs> uh, however, it's not so good if you're us because we're trying to, to hold on to that one. Uh, but uh, yeah, and then in terms of acquisition, I mean, look, th th there are generic things one, one looks for. I think one of the challenges we've got is such a big place is where, you, where do you acquire? So you've got many choices in different uh, uh, states. We have the advantage of having well, yourself and, and many colleagues in India already, so we, we understand the place and where to invest. Uh, and otherwise, I think you know, it's uh, the rule of law, it's a democracy, a lot of things are really rather straightforward and the, the things to be aware of are just, you know, look at the index and what aspects of complexity are driving that and therefore uh, what you need to be aware of. But I don't think there's any particular concerns I'd have around uh, acquisition um, beyond the, the, the generic points in any jurisdiction. Thank you, Mark. And, and rightfully, as you point out, there are various acquisitions we're considering ourselves at this point in time. Deepak, from an India perspective, acquisitions and how does that plan through? So two things. Let me take you back to Davos. Again, a round table, 18 global investors, many of them financial investors. And one of them is saying he's planning to do a 2x of his investment in India, exposure to India in the next 12 months. And the other one asked him why. And I think he summed it very well. He said, every tomorrow of India is better than today. And you know, I just sat back and I thought about it. The entire transformation, and he had read it well, but there are two elements to that. One is, you have to be close to the ground in India today to be able to understand and work in that transformation and to structure your businesses on that. You have to be on the ground. It's happening so rapidly, you cannot do it out of a suitcase. The second is get a local team. It's very interesting. I was having lunch with one of the big automakers out of North America in their office. And they were looking to move beyond, I mean, move their business out of India. And he was, and I asked him why. He said, you know what happened with us? One, we tried to impose our global business model on India. We realized too late that it doesn't work. And the second, we were not close enough to the ground to realize the pace at which you have changed and you are changing. He said that some of the things which you've already achieved are the ones we thought will not happen until 2030. Yeah, all, all positive moves and the local positive, knowledge. But you've got to be there. Yeah. Ooh. By the way, your next iPhone 14, I hope you're buying the violet one. It's being made out of India. So I thought I must mention that to you. <laughs> Thank you, Deepak. But given the time that, that gets us to a last question, and that's something that got referenced, Deepak, even in your talk, it was around human capital. You mentioned we are 1.4 billion in terms of human resources. A question submitted by our audience is, how is India going to be the leader in creating top quality human capital? Maybe Raman, I can I can pull you in to start this off and then Mark and then Deepak uh, uh, wind up with you. Okay, Shagun, I won't deal with what is normally understood as human capital index and what surrounds that. Mm -hmm. But I think probably what uh, the question where it's coming from is how is it impacting businesses going forward? Right. Uh, I'm also associated with executive search and have been for a long time. And the trends I have seen the recent past with the American uh, recession, recessionary trends, etc. What is very interesting is it is actually impacting Indian human capital only at the middle level. There is nothing touch of that is impacting adversely in the USA. Indians at the upper end of the middle section and the senior leadership. 
they are being added to. And obviously they are being added to because they have proved their worth in this ever changing and fast changing world. <laughs> so I see that trend continuing. And there's every indication that, that it will continue. We have a huge uh, Deepak uh, talked about the population, average population, etc. And if that trend continues and the education standards are going up, exposure standards are going up, it has a lot to uh, contribute to the human capital. That's Mark, the level. Thank you, Raman. Mark, eager to hear your views. I know you're very passionate about human capital and leadership overall. Yeah, I'm I, I, to be honest, I, I I sort of think things are in pretty good shape. I mean, when I think of India, we're there in significant part for the talent available, most obviously in the STEM arena. I think about we have our, for example, our global automation uh, hub there. We think about AI and other um, skills that one gets. So. From our point of view, there's a lot right. Uh, there's a, a lot to choose from, and probably the biggest issue is just competition for those resources because it's uh, we're not the first to observe that. So my take is uh, that model and the the system that's producing it will keep going, I'm sure. And India seems to me to be already offering a very uh, substantial base of the right kinds of talent for global organisations like ours to uh, be attracted to them. Deepak, your wrap up comments. You know, did you watch the World Cup final? Yes, all of you did. Fantastic final. Yeah. You know, which was one of the biggest advertisement blocks on the World Cup final. A young startup from India called Educom. It's a young digital education startup. World Cup final took a lot of money to put that ad out there. Why is it become a unicorn? Please understand India. Remember I told you about the average age 29. This is now one of the highest aspirational societies sitting on the planet. We've all been through middle class parents who've given up everything of the house, all savings only to put us through school and college. This is happening in every village. This is happening in every city. This is happening in every family. They are taking loans. They are putting their house on mortgage only so that they can put their child through better education. The first is the mindset. The second is today the ability to do that with this digitization. Education is no longer only for the rich. Digitization has taken down that good lecture to every little kid in the village who has now been given a tablet, a solar powered tablet, who accesses that lecture who takes that exam and who's now right there for the skill set. One of the most efficient plants of Toyota is in India. One of the most efficient plants of Ericsson was in India. And so is it of the others. And why did that happen? Because skilling itself is now one of the biggest things in India. From the government side, we've started the National Skill Development right. Corporation. We are skilling requirements for every company as what they want. They come back to us and say, this is what we want. This is our module. Please do it for three months. Train them and give them to us. It is at that level. So the disruption which is happening in education as being only for the rich globally and now being democratized is really coming to our benefit in the best possible manner. Thank you very much. And we're out of time. We've got a few more questions coming in, which we get back uh, uh, to the audience. I'm going to wrap up with a comment, stealing a phrase from you, Deepak. Every tomorrow of India is better than today. With that, Deepak, thank you very much for being on the webinar. Raman, thank you. Thank you, Mark, for joining and then signing off from thank this you. webinar. Thank you, audience. Thank you, everyone. Namaskar. Thank you.